afternoon, folks. It's another week here on the Inside Inside Sales Show. I, I swear, I get longer every week with my inside, and it gets harder on my voice, too. I don't know. I'm just sharing that with you. I don't know why. I, I, I think I have to go and gargle afterwards because my voice is killing me. Um, how you all doing? It's been a good week. It's that time of year, right? Eh? Eh? You know, the leaves are changing color, or depending on where you're at, they're, they're falling off the trees, or they have fallen off the trees and uh and we make our way you know into a serious autumn or again depending where you're at if you're further north uh you know maybe even an early winter oh my goodness so that's I, that's what i've been doing the last uh the last little bit uh speaking of that seasonal change for those who don't know uh, my wife and I, uh, and uh we raised our kids um they're all grown up now but we raised our kids camping now I want to be fully transparent here. When I talked about camping, I am not talking about getting a backpack, throwing it into a canoe, um, and traversing the Canadian uh, lakes and outback, uh, portaging across unpassable terrain just to continue the journey so that eight to 12 hours later, you are in some remote far flung place where civilization has never been. And you are the next meal of the local wildlife. That is not what I'm talking about. I am talking about glamping. Now, for those who don't know what glamping is, glamping is just glamorous camping, which means we have a trailer or if you're in the UK, we have a caravan. And uh, that that uh, trailer has it's like forty feet long. It's got a microwave. It's got an air conditioner. It's got a big ass shower. It's got an island. It's got a fireplace. It's got a big screen TV. This, my friends, is glamping, and it's parked, and it's on a beautiful seasonal lot on the water. We have a boat. We have a dock. It's great. Why am I sharing this with you? Well, I'm sharing this with you because it's that time of year. Um, well, where you would close the trailer down for the winter. So all the mechanicals don't break that, that they, when, if there's water in the plumbing and it doesn't freeze and blow your plumbing. So the next season you hook up to the water, you have water everywhere and flooding and that's bad. What's of note is that this year we changed our trailer out. We updated it. We upgraded it. And we now went from a family camper. We had bunk beds and all that wonderful stuff into a couple's trailer with all the amenities I just shared with you. And which means it's new. And as much as I've been camping for years, I am not an expert on this camper. Now, at the same time, we also upgraded our little boat. We went from like a 35-year-old little powerboat to like a 20-year-old little powerboat because I'm cheap as hell and I can't afford new stuff because, you know, I'm a lame sales guy. That's what I am, a lame sales guy lacking in commissions. I can't afford this big stuff. But I changed the boat. I changed the camper, and now I'm at a point of year where I need to figure out how to winterize them because the brand's making new to me. I have knowledge, but I don't have this knowledge. I've winterized before, but I've not winterized these units. So what do I do? I go and I talk to the experts. I ask question after question. How is this different from that? And my last trailer was like 15 plus years old. This is brand new. I know that my last trailer didn't have a water filtration system. This one does have a water filtration system. What does that mean from a winterizing point of view? Same for the boat. Yada, yada, yada. I ask a thousand questions. I ask a question so I have knowledge. And then the beauty of asking those questions is that once I have that knowledge, that I can now ask even more informed questions. And then when I have all the data I need, I can then go and procure all the items I need and I can attack it myself and I can winterize it and life is grand. Sounds stupid, right? It's just life. You're asking questions to figure out how to do something. Now, here's the thing. This is the part I always find interesting. Many people will go out there and instead of doing what I did, they'll pay hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of dollars to others to winterize their boat or their caravan or their trailer for them. It's a service. And those people make good money doing that. So that's your two choices. You either get the knowledge so you know how to proceed or you give it away. Now, here's the thing. Everybody listening to this show right now, you're in the former camp. In fact, people like me as the chief revenue officer, I pay you money both in base salary and in commissions 
to do what you're so good at. I'm the one paying you to go and ask questions and seek knowledge and go. And, and, and the reward is that you will go and physically use your skills to close deals. And that brings the company money and recurring revenues and life is grand and we grow and then we give you pay raises and we build a team out. And then before you know it, we're rivaling Amazon and we're hanging out with William Shatner as we go into Blue Origins into the space. That's the, that's the way it all goes. That's the plan. But you know what I find over and over again? Despite that, that's your role. I listen to calls. I listen to you. I, I listen and I speak at live events or on podcasts or on webinars over and over again. What I find is that many of you aren't as good at asking questions as you think you are, or you're not as inclined to ask the questions, or you're worried about offending the people to ask the questions. I find that you will ask one person questions and never ask anybody else in the buying committee another question because you don't want to offend your sponsor. I find questions are something that scared the living hell out of you. I find you get, I find you've got uh, the capacity to get the answers that you want as opposed to the answers that you need. How's that? That's what I find. Does any of this ring a bell to you? Are you feeling a little uncomfortable? You're like, oh, frick, pray out this question again. Yes, this question again. Questions. So who could I bring in? Fresh voice to help me out and talk about questions. Well, that would be none other than Ian Moise. Now, if you don't know Ian, Ian is a pretty cool cat. He's the chief revenue officer at One Up Sales, and you can check them out online at oneupsales.co.uk. Yes, .co.uk, which means he's going to have a far more intelligent, informed, delightful accent than this Canadian hoser has. Uh, Ian is a little bit accomplished. All right, he. I'm just a few of the awards he's got, and I'm not going to list them all. A UK Sales Director of the Year from the Besom Awards, top fifty keynote speaker multiple times. Uh, he was ranked ninth worldwide as the top 50 most influential in sales lead management, number one rated social influencer. Uh, the list goes on. This cat knows what he's doing. And so he and I were chatting, and I brought this up, and he said, Daryl, let me talk. Let me talk to your audience about questions. So, Ian, you heard me ramble. Welcome to the show, my friend. What's your immediate reaction as you heard my diatribe? Thank you so much, Daryl. And the immediate reaction is leads me in nicely because you talk to the real world, right? You put it in context of the real world. And you know what? It just made me think of what's going on in the UK right now. You, you, you may or may not have heard, but uh, would you believe there's a petrol shortage? And, you know, and there's, I, I, and there's heard people that, queuing yes. and fighting at petrol stations for, for a little bit of fuel. But here, here's the thing, right? And it made me just, as you were talking, it made me think, well, there's, there's a real life example I've got, because guess what? I've, I've, we're watching on social media and lots of people. Well, do you know anywhere that's got petrol? Oh, I've been to the petrol station and, and, and they don't have any. And I, I they ask, well, did, did you ask them when it's coming in? No. Just ask if they got any petrol. OK, well, get, get next one, though. Guess what? You, you go one low. And this will be what we're talking about, I guess, is, um, well, even if the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah. They said it's coming in Tuesday. OK, how, how are you going to know on Tuesday when it's come in? Are you going to go and sit there all day? How are you going to know? Oh, I don't know. We well, didn't ask that question, right? Uh, well, well, they, well, they said I can phone them. Okay, did 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 you ask them uh, any chance as a favour? You couldn't couldn't phone me, could you? Couldn't phone me, 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 George. Could you look use their name, right? Use your rapport building, George. That uh, got a real problem because I guess you know this this is what's going. I know everyone's got the problem, but you couldn't do me a favour on Tuesday, could you? There's a question on question, exactly what you were saying on everything. It's what's the question you didn't ask that someone else did. And in sales, that's critically important. And, and I use that all the time to because the other salespeople who were selling against don't. They've got everyone's got the same ability to ask the question of the customer. But I all the time I'm asking questions and I, and I know often that either I'll ask the customer, did, did, did the others ask this? Uh, you know, if you feel you've got the report, ask them that. But if not, you can tell. Because the fact, if, if they say, oh, I don't know, I'll have to check the answer for that. Well, I can tell you what, no one else has asked them the question then. You know, this is a fundamental skill that you should be using every day in every way, better than you are today. So what's interesting about the whole question thing, because we've talked about this before on the show, but the root folks, I mean, I, I continue to see it. And that's the part that always amazes me, is that nothing we talk about in this show is new. You know what I know. It is what it is. Off the time, what we're doing is we're talking about stuff that you go, ah, oh, I should know better. Yeah, I got to do that. Yeah, you're right. Okay. And then hopefully you go apply it. Um, but questions, you know, they do a couple things. They, 
they get you the information. I love Ian's example about, you know, there's a gas shortage and when the hell is it coming in? Some simple questions to me. Are you shy to ask those obvious questions? And can you do me a favor using rapport? But questions are not just about also, you know, getting information. Questions can also be used to set traps for the competition. You know, Ian talked about how, you know, you, by asking the right questions, you distinguish yourself from the competition right away. We lost a deal recently, and when I looked, I looked at the deal that we lost, I was getting some feedback on the postmortem from the prospect, and they were sharing with me some of their takeaways and why they went with the other vendor. And I was looking at all the takeaways, and I was like, damn, we didn't even talk about this or talk about this, and they were wrong. They drew, you know, this was a reason we went, these three reasons are the reasons we went, and two of those three were completely obnoxiously irrelevant, but of course, they didn't know any better. Because they weren't informed, and that was why you go through a sales exercise. And it was very clear to me that the other vendor had asked questions in such a way to create fear and uncertainty and doubt in their mind that are clearly were beneficial to their solution versus anybody else's solution. And, and then the prospect reacted to that and said, oh, I need to know those answers. And I need to get those answers from the other vendors. And, of course, the answers weren't as good because they were – they were traps. They were intentional traps. Questions are not just about getting information. Of course, you need to qualify and do discovery so you have context. But it's also about, you know, setting the, the playing field, having a strategy. Questions are incredibly powerful. What are the mistakes you see, in on a regular basis that reps make and continue to make? Because, you know, how to do discovery or qualification or any kind of questions or drill down is something we're taught from the very, very beginning. Yet here we are talking about it. Yeah, we are. And kids are the best at it, right? I've got two, two younger kids and, and they'll ask a question. They'll ask a question again. They'll ask it in a different way. And we, and we educate them not to do that. You know, oh, don't, don't keep asking the same question. We educate it out of people. And then in sales, we tell them, well, you should, you should be inquisitive and ask again. And, it, and it's the habitual behavior we have as kids is gone. I'll, I'll give an example, a, a, a real example as you were talking there. So I just, we've just had one where we are engaging with a prospect and so is a competitor. And the prospect, as many as many do, uh, provided a list of questions, you know, come and see us, come and talk to us. But here's here's a list of questions we'd like to answer. And here's things we'd like to show us and, and talk about. So there's the agenda. So I went through it with, with, with one of my sales team and said, right, let, let, do, do we understand? Let me ask you questions as the salesperson about these questions. Well, what, what does that mean? It says that we can assume what it means. Well, I think it means this. So, but do we know? Oh, and 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 that that thing they're asking there, why are they asking for that? Is it if it's what we think is it or, or is the de- so we went through and, and did red, amber, green, right? Some of them were absolutely slammed up. We know exactly what they're asking. It, it's, it, it'd be stupid to ask, what do you mean by that? And But some of them were, I don't know. So we went through and I said, look, phone them. This isn't a closed bid. You you can talk to them, right? Yeah. You Go and talk to them and, and say, look, we're coming in. We want to do the best job we can for you. And we don't want to make assumptions about this. Can I ask some questions about the questions? Yeah. And they did it. And we got loads of extra information about it. And it was obvious through the conversation that he had with the individual at the prospective customer that the other provider had not asked anything. Well, I know what that's going to happen. The other providers go, we got this list. They'll get they'll prep for it, maybe, and maybe do a good job of that. But they'll turn up and they'll do it on the spot. Right. Well, no. Why, why, why couldn't you ask more questions? They haven't said we couldn't. And the added bit of doing that is we have just demonstrated extra care and professionalism for doing the best job we can for them prior to even meeting them, right? Because there'll be other questions when we meet them. So I don't want to hit them with 400 questions when we meet them, if we can do a load beforehand and split it up a bit. Also, when we meet them, we're meeting more people. So we're going to look more informed than the other provider in front of them from the, from the outset during the initial engagement before we even ask any more smart questions. So we already, we're using questions to build rapport, credibility and trust in that individual prospect as part of the process. So it isn't just the question you're asking, it's the fact you are asking a question, that you care enough. You know, if I'm the prospect, are you not thinking, well, why hasn't the other vendor asked that? Why, isn't, why haven't they asked that? That's a good point, actually, because what we, we wrote, how many people write things down and think, oh, I know what I mean, and then it doesn't translate, right? Because you know what you're talking about. I know what I meant it to, to convey, but I didn't realize it didn't convey. Why, why are the others not asked that? That's interesting. 
Now, are the others going to come in and then ask on the spot, not prepared, and can't adjust to it or, or show something relevant on the spot because they've only just found out? Or are they not going to ask at all, make an assumption and show something wrong? And that, this is, that's basics. I see this all the time. And I say to my salespeople, you know, guys, just by the questions you ask and the behaviours you show, you, you differentiate yourself before you even start selling or doing a good demo or doing a good presentation, right? I remember a scene, Daryl, let me give you a primer. I always remember this, a, a, a number, about four, well, crikey, five, six, maybe seven or eight years ago, cri that's gone quick. Um, a prospect was, was engaging with me where I was at the time and coming to meet with us and looking at three other vendors who were far bigger than us, blah, 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 right? Huge names, we weren't. And came in, I said, look, at the beginning, I said, here's the first question. Are you comfortable that we challenge you today and ask lots of questions? Well, who's going to say no? Well, yeah, yeah, because the reason I want to do that, let me explain. The reason is to understand if we're the right fit for you and to demonstrate the value, the appropriate value that would be relevant to your project and not generic type stuff. But I need to ask questions to get to that. Is that are you comfortable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I may not. I'm not going to jump into showing you stuff. It's important we do that first. Yeah, yeah. We spent two hour meeting. And we didn't show a presentation. We didn't show a demo. And at the end of it, the individual, and if they listen to this, they'll know who they are because we stayed in touch over the years, um, turned to us and said, do you know what, guys? I, I, I'm, I, I've, I feel fatigued. I feel, you know, crikey, you've really put me through it here. But you've asked a load of questions that I don't know the answers to that have really made me think about our project, how we do things. And, thank, you know, for, thank you you know you've, you've tired me out but thank you and do you know what it's interesting because i've sat with three other providers and as fast as they could they asked a few questions and they got straight to look at what we've got right so we had more rapport with that individual because of what we did and because we asked questions and because we asked questions about the answers and truly showed he said you you know if you're interested and you but you've challenged me with things no one else asked me. How much more credibility do we have for that? We won that deal, by the way. No, I'm not going to say just because of that, but boy, did it start off the scene that we're different. And here's another factor. Do you not think that I had more information about the true agenda? And of course, we had another conversation when he went and got the answers of questions he didn't know the answers to. If I'm more informed to your point where you started, if I've got if I know 50 things about this project and another salesperson knows 10. Who do you think maybe I qualify out, but who do you think has got the best chance of making the right sales decisions, whether of choosing whether to continue to play or qualify out and who's most likely to win it if I stay in the game? Because I know a lot more than you do. I want to I want to I want to drill down a little bit what you're saying, but I also want to just stop and pause for a moment. Because Ian's been hammering home over and over again. You've heard him talking about building rapport, credibility, and trust. That's the power of questions. I mean, be of above and beyond, you know, getting the answers to the questions you're asking so you have a better understanding of what they want so that you can better demo or, or convey that you're the right solution. Building rapport, credibility, and trust. Folks, you may not understand this. So I'm going to try to put this to you as black and white as I can. When I, as a buyer, am given a budget, 100000 500000 millions, I am entrusted with it. And if I make a poor decision, I get leadership or more, board members, et cetera, coming back to me and challenging me and saying, why did you do that? Why did you spend that money? We've not gotten the ROI. That was a lot of money, and it's been X months, and we've not gotten the ROI. What are you going to do about that? And in this day and age where, you know, it's – talk about the great, res, the great resignation that's going on right now. Everybody's leaving bad employers. Well, similarly, it's the great firing where employers are firing bad employees. You know, the average tenure for someone in my role, for example, it's 18 months. So I don't want bad visibility upon me. In fact, I want quite the opposite. It's freaking scary, folks. It's the best way. But as a buyer, I'm scared shitless to make the wrong decision. 
You may see my bravado and my confidence and what I project and my leadership, but inside, I'm just like you and I don't want to screw up and be called out. So the more I trust you, the more I believe that you have my best interests at heart, the more I see you asking me probing questions, the better I feel that you're going to be there for me when the times get tough and every project has times to get tough, all right? That's the power of questions. See, it's he talked about credibility, which is true, but more it's about rapport and trust so that I believe that you're the right vendor. It's not just what I see on a screen. It's that I believe emotionally in my soul that you're the right vendor. I trust you. And when if, and if it's a tight, tight race feature for function, you and the competition are almost equal, that's massive. You want that. That's the deciding factor. Now, that's the one thing. I'm just being really transparent, folks. You have to understand that buyers are scared, and they're looking for you to make them feel better about their conscious choices and decisions. You have that control. Now, Ian, you made a comment. You said, can I call you to ask you questions about your questions? And they said, yes. I want to stop there for a second. One of the biggest mistakes I see is people skip over the questioning part or they they just skim it because they're in such a hurry to get to the demo and show you the features and functions. One of the changes we implemented here at VanillaSoft, and some of my reps still struggle with this. They still want to shortcut it. I understand why, is they want to do discovery or questions and demo all within the same time frame. And I'm like, no, the sales process is you set an appointment, you ask the questions, you drill down on asking questions of the questions. Exactly as you're saying, you get all the answers. If you need to go, we run out of time, you send a recap meal, uh, email, and you, you, next steps are to continue it. And then you set, you set the appointment for the demo. That's the first part, separating the demo from the discovery, not combining it. The second part is making sure you're asking all the questions of all the stakeholders. And I find, again, over and over again, reps simply want to ask questions of the person who likes them, their sponsor. And they don't want to go anywhere else and get a different point of view because, A, what if that upsets the sponsor? And, B, what if they ask questions that I don't have answers to? I'd rather not know that and let my sponsor deal with it. So I'm just going to go with my internal sponsor, and that's it. So. Two parts for you, Ian, separating the questioning from the demoing and expanding the questioning to go to more than just our sponsor. And, and Daryl, let me add to that. <clears throat> I totally agree. Let me add to that. There's nothing wrong with going back to someone when you realize there was a question you should have asked. I, I talked to my reps all the time, talk to the sales reps, and we'll, we'll look at something. They go, oh, we had this great demo. And go, okay, why not? We'll talk about it. And I'll say, well, okay. They'll tell me something they're excited about. Well, they said this or whatever. So, and I'll ask them a question. So do you, and they'll go, well, I think. Or, well, I assume. Or, well, do you know? No. Well, okay, that's something you can go back to them on then. What do you mean? Well, you, we can go and ask them a question. It's not a closed, it, you've got to ask everything on this call, uh, and then you can't talk to us again. Go back to them. Here you go. Let's go through it all. OK, we've got three questions there that are a meaningful thing. There's phone them back and say, look, I've, I've reviewed the notes from what we went through with with, with another salesperson, with my leader, whatever. You, it shows you care, right? You've spent time thinking about them. We're going through it. And there was three questions that came up that I should have asked you. So I apologize. I haven't done the best job I could have done. But can I ask you those questions now? Which customer is going to go, no, nope, no, nope, you had your chance. You should have asked then. If you've built some rapport, right, <laughs> you've got another chance to speak to them for a legitimate reason of adding value and validating, et cetera. You, there's nothing. I do it when we lose it. If you know, uh, <clears throat> we all lose deals, unfortunately. How many people call the customer when you've lost it? And I'll do it as a sales leader. So, can, can I have a chat? I, I want to understand. I'm not going to try and convince you of anything. You've made your decision. But we did invest time in the sale and hopefully you respect we did, did we did a good job didn't we yeah, yeah you did but can i have have a short amount a conversation and it's important it's a conversation to understand and get value from you in return for that what, what we could have done differently as a learning exercise so you can help me back give me some value back is that it would we, and the number of times i've had major corporations have senior people give me an hour of their time i two i remember one big major brand name two people 
because um, it had been a big bid, a lot of effort. They respected that. I, I highlighted that. So, and they gave me an hour explaining what we did, what the others did, so that we could learn from it. So there's my value. I'm not I'm not on the deal, but let, crikey, I want to get something out of this. <clears throat> you need to think about all times. And let me tell you, Daryl, why I think this happens or a contributory factor. There are so many sales methodologies. I'm not knocking any of them. Bant, Scotsman, Spin, Taz, we can keep going. Challenger sale, etc. And I think too many people are being trained or themselves taking it too literally. So look at Bant as, as an easy example. Budget authority need time scale. Well, there's four things I need to find out there from the last question. So you said earlier your budget. I immediately, my brain, when you said your budget there, Daryl, wasn't, oh, well, that's interesting, was my, my brain was going, why is that the 100 grand the budget? Budget? Why? Why have you got a 100 grand budget? What's that? Where's that number come from? There's a reason. It's 100. Why? Most people don't ask that. They go, I've got the budget. Tick, tick. I've got the budget right now. Now, how do you make the decision? I, I'm stuck on the budget. Why is it 100? Well, because that's what we spent on the last solution or whatever. Great. Um, and and Daryl, if 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 the value's there and it's the right thing to fix this problem, give this be benefit to your business, etc., nice work, whatever. Um, does that mean you wouldn't buy it if it was over a hundred? You know, is there a way of finding extra budget? Well, yeah, sometimes we we spend extra budget. Depend. Okay, and, and you've done that before. Yeah, how does that look like? What what happens if if you find this is the this is the absolute thing that we need, but it's over budget? How does that process look? I'm still on budget. I'm still asking questions that are relevant because if I don't know those things, how many salespeople are here a hundred grand here, but get the, get the basics and now they're selling to that. Well, our project's 130. I'm going to need to discount it or cut corners or take things out. <laughs> right now you're selling a different package or you're, or you're having an internal battle that you might not need to have, but you don't know because you didn't ask the questions that, that my sales rep would have asked. And, and it's just questions. My mind is racing. A couple of things. One of the things we talk about all the time, folks, and it's a hard one. It's a bit of a nebulous statement. If you want to avoid the whole negotiation conundrum at the end, then the importance is that you establish value up front. So you got to establish value. That's what we always say. Well, how the hell do you establish value? What the hell does that mean, right? And for some, for some people, they have a natural knack at it. And for others, they struggle. Most struggle with it. The irony is asking those questions helps you establish your value. And, and, and doesn't have, I want to make, make sure I really hammer this home. Those questions don't always need to be related to your software or your service specifically. So Ian right there was saying, well, why is it 100,000? Why is it 100,000? That has nothing to do with the product or the service that you're offering. It's just, it's a arbitrary number they've established. And what you can start to realize is, well, it's 100000 as Ian said, because that's what we spent before. Or it's because, well, there's no way I can spend 200000 for it because it's not, that would change the optics as perceived, and we don't view it that significant. Oh, so you've got some preconceived notions of what this will and won't do for you. What are those notions? You know, who holds those notions? Is Do you hold that? You know, et cetera. Again, nothing to do with what you're selling. It's helping you understand helping you establish value. Similarly, super questions. We brought this up before. Um, when you've made a purchase like this before in the past, how has that process gone down? Right. Who was involved? You know, what are the sign offs? You know, uh, who, you know, when, what kind of roadblocks did you have? What people got their nose put out a joint that they weren't consulted? Um, what were the big objections that, that came out or requirements that came out that you hadn't, they, you hadn't initially anticipated when you're making that investment. And you start to realize, Oh, there's the it guy and there's the legal guys and there's the bean counters. And then there's the security guy and there's the chief people officer and the list goes on and they all have different points of view. Okay. So understanding that and understanding that you're the one spearheading this and I want to respect your role, but we want to avoid that dilemma that you had last time, you know, um, what's the best way to get those people involved early on? So Together, we overcome that so it doesn't happen again, which obviously would increase your chances of getting this through and give you more sleep and less drinking. All right. And minimize the risk because you have consensus, which I'm assuming you do want to minimize the risk and exposure you have. It's great to be a leader, but it's also vulnerable to be a leader. Right. Again, nothing to do with your product or your service. 
but you're you're sniffing out, you're establishing value, setting your own rep, your own reputation. Um, I love the fact that you talked about asking questions after you lose. How many people here do that every single time? Let me ask you this to yourself: Put your hand up if you have, if you think you go back and say, "Why did I lose?" Uh, one in every five deals or fewer. One in every 10 deals. Never. Do you think you could be better if you knew why you lost? Why do pro athletes have video coaches so they can ask their coach, what's wrong? Why didn't I perform better? You know, what's wrong with my technique? What am I doing wrong here? Um, the list goes on. Questions are so crazy. And what I loved about this session today, folks, is that not once has Ian and I given you a format on how to ask questions, a framework. We've done other shows on that. Today's just been about asking questions. I love it. Ian, you're with One Up Sales. Now, I don't always ask my guests to do this, but I love what you guys do. Just for the sake of today's show, and my audience, can you tell us what One Up Sales does? Sure, and thank you for that opportunity. I won't, I won't make it a sales pitch. I should ask questions, right? So, uh, so yeah, we, we, <laughs> we simple terms. We suck data out of uh, customers' existing systems, CRM, phone system type stuff, and we represent it and give salespeople insightful views and data ratios, and gamify it. We let you run competitions from that data to drive a, you know, productivity, motivation, and behaviors and focus people on the right stuff. So we show you insights of what good looks like. What are the good metrics other salespeople are doing in your organization? So you can look at it and ask questions, we, which, which provokes conversation of how are you getting that conversion rate between there and there? So we show you the wood for the trees. Often this stuff, you've got the data already, but we present it in a much uh, more digestible fashion that you can look at it quickly, uh, gain insight as a salesperson, and you can also have nice league tables and competitions and things going off, but it's all automated. So it fit, fits, you know, I've never had, I'd never had anything of this. When I came across this, it was like, well, look, I've worked in sales a long time, running sales teams, and boy, do I know where this fits. And and I've just been with clients, uh, prospects today, people are biting their hands off because it just needs us to get in front of them. And they realize this is the missing part of a jigsaw. We're not, we don't do everything, but what we do, we do well. And it drives greater productivity and greater sales results. What I liked about the product, I was looking at your demos and whatnot on your, on your website at oneupsales.co.uk. And um, so a couple of things, folks. Clearly, you as a sales rep, as well as the sales leaders in your organization, want the analytics. That's, 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 that's the gold. What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? What do I need to do better? Um, but what I liked about it was one of the, in, in your video that you have on your homepage, um, little, it's like a three minute video and an overview. You made a great point, which I loved it. Because, you know, if I have the analysis, then I know where I'm weak. Therefore, if I'm weak here, I can run some competitions or some leagues or some leaderboards to go and try to change that behavior. And you make a comment in that video where you said the problem with some of those competitions, the gamification aspect is that the same people win over and over again. It doesn't actually cause a change in behavior in the rest of the sales team. And then you go on and show how you can use the tool to impact those people who may have different drivers affecting their behavior. That, that just like resonated with me, something fierce. So imagine using a tool like that, Combining it with the questions, how many questions are asked in any one, you know, time, right? That sounds stupid. Any one discovery session, et cetera. Um, that could be a really interesting gamif gamification campaign, et cetera. Who asks the most questions gets the, the biggest spiff this week, this month, whatever. I could go on. I don't know what's possible, but I love the idea. So that's that. That's Ian Moyes. Ian is on LinkedIn. And it's just like you might expect. It's, you know, LinkedIn.com slash in slash Ian Moyes, I-A-N-M-O-Y-S-E. Ian, thank you for your time today, my friend. It's so rare that I get to hang out with another chief revenue officer. So this is kind of therapeutic, my friend. That's awesome. Thank you. That was good fun. Thank you. You're welcome. With that, we're out of time, folks. As you might imagine, uh, good news is my trailer to winterize. The boat 
is not. And I'm off to do that this week. So wish me luck. I've asked lots of questions. I may ask a few more. If you're a winterizing expert, give me a shout. In the meantime, that's it. We're done. We're out of here. We shall see you next week right here on the Inside Inside Sales Show.